So the, the sort of the origin of this uh, idea for a conversation between you two um, came out of this, these two realities. On the one hand, um, there's, from uh, what I see, there's a lot of common ground, a lot of similarities between the two of you. You both uh, are preaching pastors. Uh, you both have writing and speaking ministries beyond your congregations. Um, you're both founders of institutions of uh, higher education, New St. Andrews, Chancellor Bethlehem College and Seminary. Um, you both have evangel evangelistic fathers, fathers from ministry who are very evangelistically oriented. Um, there's the theological kinship, reformed theology, Calvinism, and so forth. Um, and at the same time, this is the other side, there's a lot of differences. Um, uh, Pedal Baptist. Baptist, uh, premillennial, postmillennial, and uh, and then beyond that, just kind of a ministry philosophy, tone, ethos, emphasis, some other differences there. And so, well, what we thought would be helpful would be to kind of explore some of those overarching common ground and uh, and then some of those differences as well. So, I want to begin kind of here with a, a segment on the big picture. Both of you have mission statements um, that guide and govern your lives, your ministries, churches. And so I'd like to maybe have you each unpack your mission statement briefly, and then we'll, we'll reflect from there. So, John, why don't you go first? Um, mission statement for your life, Bethlehem Baptist Church, Bethlehem College Seminary, Desiring God. Go. So you want to define briefly? Do I want to define briefly? Oh, briefly. Uh, think paragraph. <laughs> Internet paragraph or book paragraph? Like, define sorry. paragraph. Yes. <laughs> This comes out of a lunch conversation. We love definitions. That's right. Um, I exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. That's my life mission statement, and it's the church mission statement, the seminary mission statement, desiring God mission statement. It's what happens if you stay in one place for a long time. It's a sweet thing, and uh, it gets tweaked in terms of its outworking, but um, a paragraph on that. Um, I exist, we'll leave that one, <laughs> philosophical, profound affirmation, how, how do I know that? But we'll leave it. I think operative is spread. I'm leaning toward a world that doesn't have a passion for the supremacy of God, just leaning there all the time? How can more people be awakened? And so secondly, I'm not ultimately, mainly concerned with rational knowledge. That is a means to an end. So I want a passion for, and not just any old God, but a supremely powerful, supremely wise, just, good, holy God. So I want passions to abound for his bigness and greatness. I want that to be uh, experienced joyfully. Those are almost interchangeable words in the statement, passion and for the joy, because I think God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him, and therefore pursuing people's joy is in God is pursuing God's glory and peoples for the joy of all peoples puts that global multi-ethnic peace on it there are 12 to 16,000 people groups in the world and I would like to be used by God to get the gospel to each of them through Jesus Christ was added interestingly because I assumed it, and you can't assume it in a world like ours that's dominated by Islam the way it is. And so through Jesus Christ means that he died. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? So the all things that I'm after are only possible because Christ died for me. That's a long paragraph. Yes, you went with the Piper paragraph. Um, so, Doug, what I want to—I want same question to you. And the, the particular statement that I'm, I'm wanting you to unpack, because you may have had others over the years, um, is all of Christ for all of life for all the world. What do you mean by that? Yes, all of Christ for all of life for all the world um, 
is entirely and fully consistent with what John was just talking about. I, I regard one of the great enemies of our time, one of the great ideological, intellectual sins or failings in our time is compartmentalization, where we divvy things out and we put something in this nook and cranny that's inconsistent with that one. So there are Christians who believe in all of Christ for part of, part of my life, or all of my life to part of Christ. So all of my life to Christ as Savior, or all of Christ, Lord and Savior, to Sunday, to my Sundays. So we want all of Christ for all of life, for all the world. And, and that, so all of Christ includes not just the, the God-man, our sa Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but it would also encompass what theologians have called totus Christus, head and body, uh, Christ and his church, all of, all of Christ for all of life, uh, Sunday through Sunday, Lord's Day through Lord's Day, everything, and for all the world, which would include evangelization, mission, uh, and it would prevent sort of a nationalistic um, parochialism where you, you have all of Christ for all of my life for us here in North America or anything like that. So uh, uh, I would say that all of Christ for all of life for all the world is our attempt at a Kuyperian statement, worldview thinking, the lordship of Christ extended into everything all the time for everyone. Okay, good. So, so I hear that. And, and we start there because when we talk about differences, I don't want that to get lost, that there's a profound, because I hear a lot of uh, a profound agreement on centrality of Christ, globalizing, totalizing, universalizing, uh, reach, and into the details. Um, but then, so then the next thing I want to do is take that a step down and talk about some th sub-themes in your ministries. Um, and so here's a sub-theme for you. Do you mind if I? Yeah. Yeah, this is supposed to be free, right? I'm, I can back up whatever <laughs> no, you no, want no, me to. No, okay, no, okay. No, 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 okay. no. I, I, I think it would be helpful to um, make a comment about the difference the way these are framed. You know, I think that would be helpful too. <laughs> my, my, Suppose I didn't. Whenever <laughs> we outvote you, you're a guest. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, Whenever I hear a three-phrase, two-phrase, I say, Senator, I need a verb. Okay. And, and, and the reason, I mean, just, just feel this. See, this is, this is a, a, a personality bent. It's a, it's a philosophical bent. It's, to me, phrases are always ambiguous without propositions. And so this is the least ambiguous person I've ever known. Okay, sitting over here except when he wants to be ambiguous, um, which he always does in one sense. But so you want to try that again? He's the least, least that's ambiguous clear. person who doesn't, who's never... Amb yeah, that, that, you just have to, you'd have to know him, right? You'd have to know him. So he's not surprised by what I'm saying. And so know that in my saying spread and my saying passion, I'm unpacking all of Christ and for all of life, because for is an unbelievably ambiguous word, right? And so just, that's, that's, I, I, that's not a difference, I don't think, in personality here, because you really are a stickler for meaning and clarification and whatnot, but uh, if, if we were to push back on each other's life statements or whatever, that's where I'd start pushing. But I, we don't need to go there. No, consider it pushed. No, I, I would agree. <laughs> I, I would agree. All of Christ for all of life, uh, for all the world, um, scans. All right? It's, it's the sort of thing that you can uh, print and say, and then tell people this is what we mean. The verb is reigns. So Jesus reigns. Um, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus is king. We're talking about the crown rights of King Jesus. So the Lord Jesus reigns, comma, all of Christ for all of life, for all the world. That's, that's not a mission statement. That's a statement. That's, yeah. just, that's not, that's, you got to have a... So, so what should we do? What, okay, yeah, that's the truth. What mission should we do in response is, to that? What would what you a, say? What, what, yeah. So what? You know? so, uh, so what I, I would do is I'd say, all of Christ for all of life for all the world. Can I have an amen? amen. That's the mission. <laughs> so I exist to pursue amen to these three statements. 
Yeah, I, well, I think that's totally well, worthy. I, I, I want the world to say amen to yes. the Lord Jesus yes. reigns. And I want, mean it with all their heart. I want the church. Really be happy about it. Really happy about it. I want the church to say, <laughs> are you holy, trying satis- to your holy satisfied. Are you trying to take his <laughs> mission statement? I try to show how much we agree. <laughs> yeah. So when we say all of Christ, not a partial Christ, I want the church to say amen. When we say for all of life, not just your Sunday go to meet and Christian stuff, can I have an amen? Yes, all of my whole life. Um, not just for us, but for the people who've never heard. Do I have agreement there? So basically, that, the mission is to get people to confess that truth. So it's a, it's a propositional statement that Jesus reigns, he is king, these, are, these things are true, and then we are summoned to affirm that with a whole heart. Okay, good. That was easy. Um, <laughs> sub-themes. John, I want you to comment uh, you know, briefly explain this sub theme. You've written a book about this. Don't waste your life. And then Doug, I believe, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be the... Uh, uh, Go ahead, waste it. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, the motto of Canon Press. No, the motto of Canon Press, I think, what is or was living the good life one family at a time. So don't waste your life, live the good one. And so I, I will start with you. What do you mean by don't waste your life? Um, and, yeah. Fulfill the mission. You want more than that? Well, that was a short paragraph. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, little bit more about kind of okay. what, what yeah. are you aiming it at? Ju- where did, that, where did ju- that come out of? It just means un- I'll spend another paragraph unpacking the mission. Um, why do human beings exist is what I am driven by. Why does God exist, first of all, and why do we exist? We exist to join God in his reason for existing. He exists to make much of God. At least he created the world to make much of God, and therefore we exist to make much of God in Christ. So in that book, I unpack Philippians 1. Um, My eager expectation and hope is that I might not be ashamed, but that now as always, Christ might be magnified in my body whether I live or whether I die, whether by life or by death. So Paul's passion, key word, was to magnify, which means make Christ look magnificent in the way he lived, which is the unwasted life. So a, a wasted life is a life devoted to anything that does not make much of Christ. Everything should somehow figure into making Christ look great. And I measure the significance of my life by whether or not I am intentionally pursuing, and then the fruitfulness of my life, whether people are responding to that magnificent Christ the way I think Paul unpacked it. Because the reason you can make Christ look magnificent in your death is that to die is gain. So we experience death as gain when all we get is Christ and we lose everything else and we call it gain, which means we must be totally satisfied in Jesus when we lose our wife and children and health and this world and only have him, we call it gain. And that's what I'm after. I'm after people who so love Christ, are satisfied in Christ, that when they lose everything but Christ, they can call it gain. Okay, good. So living the good life one family at a time, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, let me um, begin by responding to what John just said by, by saying I would ag- agree with absolutely every, every word, everything there, amen. And I think that this illustrates when we get to some of the differences where those differences would be. Theological agreement, exegetical agreement, yes, this uh, Christ demands our highest allegiance, we should affirm this, and then we get to the level of execution. And uh, and so I, one of the things I'm concerned about, and this would be a pastoral concern, it's not a concern about the mission, it's not a concern about any of those things that he wanted um, uh, to do, but I would want to urge people to remember that in executing the mission, it's possible to outrun your own supply lines. It's, it's possible to be Napoleon marching on Moscow and and cut off your supply lines or lose contact with your supplies, and then there you are with winter coming in Russia, which is not a good place to be. Um, so th- there are many people who say, the, um, if you outrun your own supply lines, to use that metaphor, uh, or out you um, 
outrun your own headlights. You're just, you're just going, this is the mission, the mission, the mission. Well, sometimes that's a way of wasting your mission. You, sometimes you miss the mission because you're too eager um, for, for the mission. So that, but that's a difference of caution. Uh, you know, like, okay, make sure your, your people aren't doing this, but yeah, yeah, we agree, that, that kind of thing. That's where the, the, the possible differences would come up. Now, our emphasis, uh, teaching people to live the good life one family at a time, that emphasis, um, is that it's not possible, I don't believe, it's, I don't think it's possible to make a good omelet with rotten eggs. And Jesus says when you, you cross earth and sea to make a proselyte, and when you get him done, you, he's twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And you, you can only export what you have. You, you, and now, the danger is if you concentrate on cultivating it so that you have it to export, and then you ha you've got a wonderful community going or a wonderful church life going or your families are great, then it, the temptation is to be too cozy, and then you don't want to go because it's so wonderful. Here. So the temptation, I can hear John saying, yeah, make sure you guys don't get too comfortable with your good life one family at a time, and you've got a wonderful thing going, and then you forget the lost. I would say, yeah, amen. We have, we have to be concerned about that. But I, then I would say, don't be so eager to reach the lost that when you get there, you're about as lost as they are. And you know, th there are many, many people who have gotten chewed up by the machinery of mission and they haven't had a life. They haven't had um, a robust experience of Christ worshiping God with their families and their people and everybody's together. And then we take that on the road. So no qualms at all about it's all of Christ for all of life for all the world. It, this is to go to the whole world. But what I want to do is make sure that the families are getting it. So um, the, the families are experiencing what we want the families out there to experience. Because if we don't have it, we can't teach it. If we don't have it, we can't communicate it. If we don't, you can only export what you have. So the one family at a time is not teaching Christians to live the good life one family at a time, and then, well, there we're in, we've, we've had our, our comfortable life, and then we're done. That would be the abuse of what we are saying. But I'm just wanting to make sure that we uh, have a healthy experience of what we want other people to experience. Okay, so you, you describe the difference, I think, in terms of emphasis. Is that how you think about I mean, do you hear a difference there between kind of orientation, or would you agree with that kind of assessment of this? It's at the top level, it's, a, it's yes and amen, and then you work down to execution, and there's, is, is there a different emphasis, do you think, in terms of the way that you think about mission? And, or y Yes, and I think, I think um, I'm weak. I, I don't hear what he's saying as a um, I don't feel any need to justify my way. I think one family at a time would be a weakness of my ministry. So, yes. I think a difference would be um, in um, specific, uh, explicit specificity. When you say the good life, I say, what's that? I'm, I'm always pressing, you know, towards ultimacy. Define it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and make Christ present in it, you know. The good life, one family at a time, could be pagan. That's a pagan statement. Um, and you have to put it in the context of the wider man and ministry. And so I would just say explicitness matters to me. But that, that's marginal. The, the real issue is I think Doug's ministry has been much more uh, sp specific on the ground, fleshed out than mine. And that's not a bad thing. I, I think it's part of who I am and part of what I don't think I know that probably has left me operating at a 10,000 foot level as I've preached and ministered and, and Doug is, is, is coming down across the treetops a lot more frequently. Okay, so when you, you said when you preach, live the good life, you're mindful of the tendency toward insular, ingrown, we can just camp out in our holy huddles. Mm -hmm. How do you counteract that? In in how, like how are you guys thinking and, and processing? Okay, we need to make. Sure, how do you prevent that? If that's if that's the tendency, how do you prevent how do you prevent that from becoming well, ingrown? By echoing what John just said, someone could interpret the good life as a suburban house and a sweet barbecue set up in the backyard and and you know swimming lessons for the kids and you know, that's the good life. Well. Uh, as I'm understanding the good life, that's not possible 
outside of gospel categories. So the good life for a husband and a father and his family, uh, Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And I don't think the good life in your household is possible unless you're dying, um, unless you're giving yourself away, unless you're loving your wife as Christ loved the church. So the good, the good life is always gospel goodness. It's all, it's, it's, so in suburban America and in inner city works and wherever you happen to be, there's always going to be temptations to be selfish and self-absorbed and self-centered and carve out a niche for yourself. And so what I try to do in my preaching is emphasize, uh, take up your cross daily, uh, come follow me. So that, that's, that's the way to the goodness. There's no end run around it. You can't circumvent the cross to get to the good stuff. Um, it's the story that's the good stuff. It's the death, burial, and resurrection that's the good stuff. So, okay, so then it sounded like you, you know you were mi- you're mindful of the the tendency um, we exist to spread, and you can get spread thin supply line thing. How are you? How do you think about trying to counteract that, prevent that tendency from burning people out? Because we're there's a mission, and there's a there's a lost world, and we're we're pushing, and we're pushing, and we're and there's people who need to know passion for supremacy of God. How, how are you thinking about how do, we, uh, how do we counteract that or prevent that from burning people out? By emphasizing the sweetness of satisfaction in Jesus. That's the way I do it. Whether that's the best way to do it is another question, but I would say w- what I want to do is say that the very nature of my mission, like you would say, uh, if you can't make a good omelet with rotten eggs, I would say you can't awaken passion for Jesus where you don't have it. You, you can't cause Egyptians to turn to Christ with thrill if the missionary is bored with Jesus or if he's so eaten up with anxieties that he's wrecking his kids. Anxieties are solved by Don't you know you have a Father in heaven who supplies all your needs? Consider the lilies, consider the ravens. And Jesus argues for peace by the sufficiency of the Father. So my my answer to how to uh, keep from thinning it, meaning having it so ineffective in home and soul and elders, is to try to teach how one maintains a deep, sweet, satisfying, through all hell and high, high water, peaceful enjoyment of Jesus. And, and then my, my belief is that out of that grows k- kinds of love and virtues that, that sweeten relationships. That's helpful. And I think we'll probably circle back to these things in, in a moment. I want to move uh, to kind of a second segment here on influences. And I have two in mind in particular. Um, Jonathan Edwards and C.S. Lewis, who have both had influences on, on both of you. So, um, John, I'll start, we'll start with you on this one, and we'll start with Edwards. Um, what would you say the, how would you describe briefly again, the main impact that Edwards has had on you, and then secondly, the main impact you hope he has on uh, the wider church today, whether that, it, they may not be the same thing, they may be the same thing, but you and then the wider church. You know, whenever I think about documenting influences in my life, I just want to put over the beginning, I, I'm not sure that this is the main impact. It's just a, a huge one. Because I think there are impacts on us we don't know. I think as I read my Bible each day, I don't know what it's doing. It's doing more. It's doing more than what I think it's doing. And so when I read Lewis or Edwards, I'm sure more was happening to my soul than I can document. But what I can document is the end for which God created the world, that book, and the freedom of the will, that book, and the nature of tr- um, um, religious affections, that book, just take those three in three distinct ways, were massively shaping. In for which God created the world, set my mission. God created the world for the glory of God. God is for God. God exalts God. God worships God. I mean, that's my message, and I got it from Edwards from the Bible, I hope, through Edwards. Secondly, the freedom of the will, that the governance of all things 
including the moral actions of all men, is not inconsistent with the blameworthiness of their sin or the virtue of their deeds or their accountability. That is a, David Wills says that book is a watershed book. For him, it was for me. You're reading it in seminary, and you know if you go this way, all the water runs to the Pacific Ocean. If you go this way, all the water runs to the Atlantic Ocean. And if you decide he, he cannot be that in control and still have human uh, personality mean anything, then, then you go to the Pacific Ocean. So that, that book settled the, the core Calvinistic issue on the freedom of the will for me. And then, and then the religious affections was a heart-rending exposure of my subtle sinfulness, all, all with a view to the massive centrality of the affections in human life. So those, those two things are just big for me, and, and he was the strongest voice. Okay. Doug, I don't, um, maybe before you, uh, same question to you, but maybe as you answer it, you can describe just kind of how you've, how you've encountered Edwards over the years, because I know in one sense you've kind of got back into him recently. I've seen things in your writing, but he, he goes, you guys go way back. Yeah. So maybe talk about, um, but, but same question of what are the main documented ways that he's impacted you? Yeah, that's a great question. He had a pivotal role in my theological pilgrimage. Um, I grew up in a conservative evangelical home. Um, you, you just pick up comments here and there, the kind of world in which Finney was a good guy. Um, and nobody was reading him or studying him, but he was just a, a hero. And, and I had read uh, lectures on revival, and I was appalled. Um, you know, yikes, this is, you know. And so I put that down and said, if that's revival, I don't want re I don't want. Because what he's, he's saying is revival is a work of man, yeah, and you, it's just the use of proper means, and if we, we can gin it up if we just know the right buttons to push. Yeah, you, you, we, can, we can build this machine ourselves, and we can operate it ourselves. And so, uh, what, so that was part of the backdrop. Then through other circumstances that I won't go into, I, be, I had become post-millennial. Um, it was really weird being an Arminian, evangelical, conservative, post-millennial. Post-millennial. It was all downhill from there, wasn't it? Was it was all, but very fun. It's, it's fun going this fast when you're going downhill. Um, <laughs> you know, there were maybe, at, at the time in the country, there were maybe two post-millennialists. Um, you know, Lorraine Bettner and John Jefferson Davis. Now there uh, are three. <laughs> But we're gaining. <laughs> well, I, so I'd become a post-millennialist, and, and somewhere in there I read Ian Murray's book, The Puritan Hope. And, and after I became post-millennial, I thought, okay, now I believe the earth is going to be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But then I looked around at the condition of the church and the condition the world was in, and I was thinking, well, not at this rate, you know. <laughs> You know, talk about a discrepancy between what I had now come to believe and what I saw with my eyes. Um, and so that caused me, and I thought, all right, if that ever happens, if what I believe eschatologically is going to happen, then future historians will describe it as a great revival, an awakening. So I, had, I was forced to go back and say, well, maybe Finney isn't the last word on revival. And that took me back to Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards. And so I read his account, uh, his Northampton account, and I, uh, somewhere in there I read the Religious Affections Northampton account, and, and I came to the recognition that historically the kind of revival, I was not a Calvinist yet, but the, the kind of revival that didn't creep me out the way the Finneyite approach did was historically a kind of fruit that grew on one kind of tree, and that was Reformed preaching. And so a few years later when I was uh, going, working through the whole Calvinism uh, thing, um, which was a humbling experience. John, so first, Jonathan Edwards left a good taste in my mouth with regard to revival and awakenings and reformation, re reading that. And then uh, when I was working through the Calvinist era, when I was sorting through all those things, um, the freedom of the will uh, was magnificent. It just sorted everything out in terms of the psychology of how, how the human heart did the will is this... Uh, arm that reaches into the, the this mechanical arm like you, like when you take your uh, you go to the county fair and there's a bin full of teddy bears and they've got this mechanical arm that grab well the mechanical arm doesn't have any 
power to create the contents of the chest, the, the, the contents of what's pulled out. Um, and Jonathan Edwards taught me that the will pulls what's out of your heart, whatever's in your heart. And, you, and if I could repent and believe with my old heart, why do I need a new one? You know, um, and so God gives me a new heart. And, I, and all the psychology of uh, Calvin, Calvinistic psychology all clicked and came together. For, for me with Edwards, and I'm greatly indebted to Edwards. So he was, since that time, was great, good good guy, all about him, but so I'd read a, a number of his books, and then went on and did, other, went on and did other things, and then um, uh, a year or two ago, you came out to New St. Andrews and gave a talk at Disputatio, rebuking us all at New St. Andrews for being so Edwardsian without doing homage to him. You know, why isn't he in the curriculum? And yeah. Yeah, what are you doing? Yes, I, I berated you. <laughs> yeah, he was very forthright. And, you know, Edwards' emphasis on typology and his emphasis on Trinitarian, uh, his Trinitarian emphasis, was, which is one of our emphases, and his, um, his typology, his post-millennialism, you know, all of these things. Why, why are you guys not more explicitly in there. We thought he was a good guy and we're happy for him to have done his thing, but we, anyway, after that, I, I, taught, I decided to teach an elective on Edwards and we, um, and that um, re-kickstarted it. And, and having read some of his stuff again recently after the 20 years or whatever it had been uh, since I'd been reading him, it just really, I was thunderstruck actually at some of the stuff that's going on in Edwards. So I, I made a decision there to, uh, I was, Yale has got a nice um, collection of his uh, collected works, and so I've been piecemeal buying them, pretty expensive, but um, piecemeal buying them and working through, I decided I'd like to work through the whole set of Edwards' books before I die. It's just, he's just wonderful. Um, you mentioned that the, the Trinitarian emphasis, and I know that this is something you've written on as well in uh, some of your books. There's an Edwardsian flavor on the Trinity. And, and so I'm wondering, um, when, when Edward Scholar describes him, uh, or says, uh, the Trinity is like a subterranean river that just kind of runs underneath everything he wrote and thought and did. And, and I, I find that encouraging. And I'm wondering if you guys can give some, some counsel and help. How do you keep, how do you ensure that when we talk about God and you preach about God and you, and and so forth, that you're, we're always talking about the triune God. Do you have to make it explicit all the time? Are there other ways that you think about, I want people to, to think like triune Christians and not just generic deity um, sorts of things. So it, is, is, how, does, how does the Trinity shape ministry, shape life, shape worldview for, for you guys? We can start with you, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what I do, but look, you know, this is one of the problems of being old is that you look back and you think, could have done that better. Um, so I, I haven't preached many sermons on the Trinity. And, and probably I should have preached more than I did, so confession. Well, but even, even there, so but that's where Edwards never wrote anything that was published on the Trinity. There's the unpublished essay, which is, I think, what you were referring to. And so, he, so here, here's what I do do, and, and I'm, I don't regret it. Um, I do exposition and call out what's there. And I think a pastor should, in passing, regularly, make sure that when he uses the word spirit, he says he, and he says a sentence or two, why he says he. And he draws out the distinction between the fact that all three are mentioned in this paragraph and the way they are interworking and their economic distinctions and how they are one. So I'm working through John now, and that's been a prominent theme in John, is that uh, we beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you, you don't fly over those, you say it. But in general, I think pastors who, who don't preach individual sermons on the Trinity will, by their use of language and their occasional references to their personhood keep alive in their people that we're talking about Son, Father, and Spirit as persons in one God. I, have the same question. I, I agree with everything um, 
John just said about how you tackle it in preaching as it comes up in the text. Uh, don't be shy about pointing to those things. Uh, I, I don't think that you should have to say, I don't think you can say everything you must say all the time about everything in every instance. You've got to let some things go unsaid, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with that approach. If you're doing expositional preaching, then it's in the text, and it's going to come up in the text. When you, uh, The one thing I would add in our, in, uh, I would like visitors to our church to not be able to go away. I, I would not want them to come for a month or two months and not know that this is a Trinitarian church. I would like them to know on the first Sunday this is a Trinitarian church. And uh, my call to worship is let us worship the triune God. Everybody stands up. Uh, every Sunday we say the, the Apostles' Creed. We, can, you know, we confess the members of the Trinity. Many of our hymns are Trinitarian in structure, uh, a verse about the Father, a verse about the Son, a verse about the Spirit. Um, and then the expositional preaching ministry is just as job, uh, John described. Um, I'd venture to say, John, that your book, um, Pleasures of God, at, at least for me, on the Edwardsian stuff is, is where I've, I see that come out most fully, and they're just publishing a new edition. Um, anything you want to say about that book and, and, and how, um, you know, everybody, a lot of people come into contact with your ministry through something like Desiring God, um, but in some ways, Pleasures of God goes underneath that. So you want to say something about that, that book in particular? Yeah, I thought your question on the Trinity might have been, since uh, Lewis has this subterranean Trinitarian thought, how does it function that way for you? And so this gives me an occasion to answer that question with the pleasures. Um, Edward's understanding of the Trinity is that the Son is the perfect idea, word, thought of the Father. The Father has a picture of himself, and therefore that movement in the Godhead is reason, and is thought, and is head. Between those two flows an infinite energy of delight, carrying, as C.S. Lewis exactly said, it's like an esprit de corps in the Trinity, carrying so fully the personhood of the Son, the personhood of the Father, that it stands forth as a third reality, only it is distinctly defined as the delight that they have in each other. I was just reading before you preached the first message that you preached when you said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, pleasure between Father and the Son, the Spirit is descending like a dove. And as I read that, the morning before you preached, I thought, those are the same. Those are the same. One with word, one with symbol dove. The dove is descending, and the word is being spoken. My pleasure is on you. There he is, a bird called the Holy Spirit. So the implication of that is that in the Godhead, you have the essence of humanity, head and heart. You have, you have true knowledge of God in God, the Son, and you have true love for God in God, the Spirit, and therefore we are made in his image as capable of knowing him and loving him. And everywhere I move and everywhere I go, I'm thinking in those terms. Right knowledge of God, right affections for God, everywhere. So that's the subterranean effect of the Trinity on me. So head and heart for you are Trinitarian categories. And they, they were this way for Edwards. And, and when you think about them, you think whether or not it ever comes out specifically in every message or something like that, that is a subterranean river yeah. as you if as some you If some person from Mars or some um, atheist said, where's that come from? Where's your ultimate basis for giving a hoot about what you think and giving a hoot about what you feel? I would say, because God is the ultimate knower and feeler, and he made me in his image to reflect him that way. Amen. Um, Doug, you, um, I think you said this in the introduction to, to Doug the other night, and so I want to I turn to, to, to Lewis for a moment. Um, is this, so is this right? that Lewis has had more impact on you than all other theologians outside the Bible combined. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why don't you unpack how, why, that's, that's a pretty tall 
because uh, you would even say that about Edwards or somebody like that. You wouldn't say over all, over all other combined. Not You'd say, that I know of. <laughs> okay. He may have, and I don't know it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So why don't you explain uh, the the bromance with uh, yeah, with Lewis? I, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go on record as saying I don't like the word bromance. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. That's not. That's not working. Wish he hadn't said See, that. I'm. I'm not. It's not. Don't receive that. Um, so, um, with with Lewis, I've, uh, Lewis died when I was ten years old. So I was born in '53, and 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 the uh, my folks started reading the Narnia stories uh, to us in the 50s when I was a young boy. And I think they were maybe still coming out. They were, um, they were either just, just fresh on the market or still even coming out when we were first introduced to, um, to the Narnia stories. And we loved those stories, adored the stories. And my, my dad would read to us, I was the oldest, and my dad would um, read a chapter or two in the evening and I would sneak the book off and finish it that night. <laughs> Finish it that night, and you know, it, it was just I, I grew up grew up as a sort of quasi Narnian, um, so that that was the first thing. And then in high school, I began reading the first serious theology that I began to read was Lewis, uh, the Problem of Pain and Mere Christianity, and I started to read his his straight um, writing, and, and that had a big influence on me. And then when I started to read other other great influential theologians that I've read, people, John Calvin, and uh, you know, there, they, there are a number of theologians who've had a monumental impact um, in my life, but always in a, but they were, it's striking that they were always in a Lewis context. You know, it's, it's like Lewis set the key or the pitch that everything is, in, in, um, is understood in. So I was processing Calvin as a as a Lewis guy, and I was, and, and so accepting one didn't mean rejecting the other. And as um, as I got older and I got into the ministry, I, I began to read just dis, in a disciplined way all kinds of things that Lewis had written. And uh, I just, and the more, I, and then I go back and read, reread some of the early stuff that I read, and I think, oh, that's where I got that. You know, that, I, I remember that now. I learned that first from him, and I learned that first from him. And, uh, so that's one thing. His, the, and there are areas where I disagree with him. I think he's out to lunch. And there's, but he's the kind of writer who can edify me even when I think he's being crazy. Um, I, in letters to Malcolm on prayer. He's got some stuff in purgatory in there. and There's, there's some just stuff I, that's nuts. But his, and Reflections on the Psalms is a glorious book. But he says some atrocious things in that book about some of the Psalms. And you, you, you discount that, set it, put that on the side of the plate. And even when he's being not very good, it's uh, edifying, you know. It's just edifying to me. It really resonates with me. So I, I, I love his way of thinking. I love his commitment to clarity of thought. I love his rejection of relativism, his rejection of subjectivism, coupled with his vivid Christian imagination. So he... Um, he's not a logic chopper, but he's he's a logician, but not a pedantic logician because he's got he's a Christian romantic and a Christian logician at the same time. He marries things. He brings together in his person things that I think are just absolutely essential for us to have together in one man. And then the last thing I would say is that Lewis was a jovial man, and his joviality. Um, uh, Michael Ward's book Planet Narnia is a great. Book. And uh, and I I want to live as a if if you permit this astrological observation I want to live as a Calvinist under Jove, not a Calvinist under Saturn. Um, so ex explain what you mean by that. Just I mean, I mean tease that a little bit because if people don't know the astrological background to those. Okay. Things. Well, the first thing to say when you use the word astrological. Uh, is, we're not talking about the newspaper column astrology. Uh, you know, we're not talking about any kind of superstition or anything like that. But um, th this is just a shorthand metaphorical way of saying um, uh, I, I, I much prefer the God is good, life is good, uh, Christ is good, he's given you all things richly to enjoy. 
uh, Calvinism to eat your spinach Calvinism. So um, Saturnine Calvinism would be it's your, it's your duty, it's puddle glum. And puddle glum is an endearing character off to the side, but you don't want all puddle glum. Yeah. You don't want all puddle glum all the time. Um, and so I, I, I want to see, and, and Lewis himself, in selected literary es- essays, uh, Lewis's defenses of the Calvinists and Lewis's defenses of the Puritans, I think are, are among, among the most compelling defenses of the Puritans when people talk about Puritans being puritanical or what they mean is Victorian or uptight or blue, you know, blue nose or whatever. Lewis says in selected literary essays that the Puritans were, he said, if I may use the the name of a great Christian, a great writer, and a great Roman Catholic, he said the Puritans were much more Chestertonian than their adversaries. And that's what I want to be. I want to be uh, a Chestertonian Puritan as Lewis describes them. And, and in history, that's the first hundred years or so in, of the Reformation, the, the, the era of um, when, when the Reformation first exploded. As in English literature in the 16th century, Lewis's book, he, he says that, that the keynote for the Reformation was relief, forgiveness, joy, um, be done with all the motive scratching, be done with all the digging around, trying to, uh, the introspective, gunk. And then later on, I think there was a, a, a reformed stream that, that turned inward in an introspective, unhealthy way later. But that wasn't characteristic of the relief that God gave to the West in the Reformation. And I learned that, I learned that from Lewis. John, kind of same question over to you. Um, what main impact of Lewis, um, if it's the same things here, then, then unpack them in your own way, if there's different things that you've picked up from him. I'm listening and thinking they're probably profoundly similar. The way I have put it, and this is why I wasn't sure whether he was a, the most dominant impact, is that Lewis slash Wheaton College, they're almost synonymous where they hit me, put kindling in place and the fire fell at Fuller with Dan Fuller and Jonathan Edwards. The kindling was not the content of the theology. It was a way of thinking and seeing the world. He was, the the book that moved me most, and I cannot find it in print anywhere, but I can see the cover, a little thin 30-page paperback called C.S. Lewis, Romantic Rationalist. The very title made my spine tingle because I wanted that so bad. I knew from 10th grade geometry, I loved thinking and proving things with axioms. And I knew from the awakening in the 11th grade with Mrs. Clanton, I love to read and write poetry and see the world and feel the power of nature. And those felt at odds. Geometry and literature? Weird. And then you see this title, Romantic Rationalist. You say, really? And you dive into that ocean and you just want to swim all day long, called C.S. Lewis. So the, the kindling that was put in place is there hasn't been in the last 200 years a sharper log, logician than C.S. Lewis, probably. What do I know? But he was really sharp. And nobody, nobody compares, do they, of what he saw when he looked at trees and faces and ground and books. He saw things. He saw things. And he talked about their quiddity, the sheer thisness of reality. And whenever I read him, I feel like I come alive. I feel like my eyes are open. I have to go back to Lewis for kind of like a dose of reality to just see the world because the world starts to be rationalistically hazy or emotionally hazy. And you lose the robustness of the jovial orientation of just clouds. I mean, I find myself walking to church, anxious about the meeting, and then suddenly Lewis, the Holy Spirit, bang, look at this sky, look at that sunset, look at these cars like a river going under this bridge, wake up to reality, this is awesome, this is like a -a tilt-a-whirl or whatever, you know, it's just... uh, Whatever that was. uh, So those two things, 
a, a mind uh, lucid and clear in his thinking, A is A and not, not A, and uh, that's a tree, and you're tempted to worship, except that you're a Christian now, and so you just enjoy it as a creature. Now, you, you go to seminary then with, with your heart just seething with readiness to have passion for something and your mind ready to latch onto something and, and, and understand it and, and Calvinism shows up. <laughs> and, and you just say, okay, now I think I'm home. I spend the rest of my life trying to spread this passion. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And this is a good place to, to this train. Is, this is going to be shown. They're filming this and everything. I'd like to go on the record now as saying that if anybody ever comes up with an idea of publishing C.S. Lewis, a reformed appreciation, uh, contributing essays from different reformed th thinkers, um, I would dearly love to be able to claim it was my idea and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then parlay that into being able to contribute an essay to that. I, I think John could probably pull some strings with some people and get so, that done. So, yeah, there you go. New book project. I think the editor is probably in the audience. That's, yeah, <laughs> good. Um, and I'd also like to note that I don't think you meant this, but I think somewhere in there you said you're walking to church, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, C.S. Lewis, says, and <laughs> I, I, I said C.S. Lewis, comma, the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's a comma there. It's there's the old comma. problem of the serial comma. I mean, uh, yes. Yes. The Holy Spirit <laughs> uses many means. <laughs> And the means he has used to make Lewis a constant reminder, wake up. Clyde Kilby, my Lewisian incarnation at Wheaton, published an anthology of Lewis's quotes. And the name of the book was A Mind Awake. And that, that title, just that's what I mean. So having read Lewis now, as I walk through life asleep... The wake-up calls that happen, I believe, are God-given. And instrumentally, the memory of what I've seen in Lewis is what he uses, often. Okay, so thus far we've mainly focused on areas, I think, of profound agreement, appreciation for, for, different, uh, for Lewis and Edwards and so forth. And so I want to talk a little bit about maybe a place where there's some differences. Um, so segment three here is on Christian hedonism. And so, Doug, a couple of years ago, you wrote a couple of blog posts uh, interacting with Christian hedonism. I think you just reread Desiring God or were doing something in relation to that. And you had some suggestions, modifications for things that uh, we should, you know, push it further or something like that. You were amening it and then saying, let's, let's go a little bit further up, further in. Further views. up, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the, two, the two terms you advocated for, one of which we maybe talked about already, so we can focus on the second, was a, a Trinitarian hedonism. So we've kind of already talked a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, covered that. Um, and the one maybe to spend a little bit more time on is incarnational hedonism. So what do you mean by incarnational hedonism, okay. Christian hedonism? Um, this is, I think, another example of... I think there's some differences here, but there's, there's going to be a lot of yes budding, I think, in, in this. Because, John, you recently wrote something. Um, you were discussing C.S. Lewis's Meditations in a Tool Shed, of the, the idea of looking along the beam of light and looking at it and the differences there. And, and God's, the material world that God has given us is a revelation of his character. And the trick is, how can we be God-oriented, God-centered, God-saturated as we're dealing with material things. And, and that's, so if, if you ask for me for a snapshot of what do you think of John Piper's Christian hedonism, I'd say I'm enthusiastically in favor of it and like what he's done. I'm grateful for him uh, doing all the spade work that he's done. The, I'd like more bacon and more beer involved in, um, in this hedonism and not... <laughs> We have an amen to the baker. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. If, well, yeah. the, so the, the, the question is. Some, somebody just went, mm, bacon. It was for the bacon. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the question is, it, there's a way of um, pursuing the pleasures of God and wanting to commune with God in these pleasures in a way that sort of detaches from the world you're in. You know, in your prayer life, in your worship, in, a, in an exalted spiritual frame of mind, which, of course, I'm not against any of that. But I also want it to be constantly and regularly engaged with this world. And 
not to think that I can protect myself spiritually from becoming an idolater by diluting this world at all. This world is thick. The world is thick. It presents itself to us as thick. And I believe, to use the words of uh, um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, the, the world is charged with the glory, the grandeur of God, he says. Uh, it flames out like shook foil. So this material world, the thicker it is, the more solid it is, the brighter it is, doesn't make it more of a distraction. So this goes back to Lewis also in The Last Battle and in The Great Divorce. The resurrected state is solid, more solid than here. It's more substantive than here, which means if you're following the argument, it doesn't make it more distracting away from God than here. Right. If materiality, if the, if the quiddity of the thing, if the, if, the, if the substance of these things were an inherent distraction and I could protect myself spiritually by finding a diluting agent that would make the material world thinner, my, my money thinner, my house thinner, my food thinner, if I could dilute it and protect myself spiritually, then of course that's what I ought to do. But I don't think... That's a protection. So this is where um, when John and I were talking at one of our, our meals together and, uh, and he was saying the New Testament is full of warnings about wealth and material goods and, and I agree with that completely. The, the New Testament constantly tells us to guard our hearts over against the distractions of the world. I just don't think guarding our hearts can be accomplished by minimizing the material. I think it, it is accomplished by maximizing the gratitude for these things. So I look th um, through the material world to God, and that's what I think the protection is. So if I pull away in, a, in an ascetic way, it feels like I'm protecting myself from materialism, but I don't think I really am. So this is a pagan story, but one time Diogenes, the cynic, went over to Plato's house, and when he went into Plato's house, there were some fancy rugs on the floor, and Diogenes, the cynic, stomped on the rugs and wiped his feet and said, thus I trample upon the, the pride of Plato. And Plato responded mildly with greater pride. All right? You can, there, there's such a thing as spiritual pride. I, if I can, I can detach myself from the things of the flesh and be giving way to the flesh. So, now, all of these things, I think in, in the abstract, I, I don't, I can't imagine John and I disagreeing on this, but it's, this is where the practical turn of mind comes, that when you're in the pulpit and you, and you have affirmed the goodness of pleasure and the goodness of hedonism and the good, you know, goodness of all these things, and then you're sending them all out to try this at home, what do you caution them to not do? How do which way do you lean when you say, now, now don't get too wrapped up in your car and don't get too wrapped up? You know, are you cautioning, cautioning them against material goods or are you cautioning them against maybe a more ethereal, spiritual, Euclidean pride. You know, I, my tendency is to caution against the immaterial pride and exhort people to get, may be grateful for the stuff and make it thicker and make it more grateful. Make the soup, make the, make the soup into stew and make it, make it thicker and be grateful for it and say your prayers. You know. John, any thoughts? There? Yeah, before I say anything, uh, by way of information, a question. Is nature, the material world, a mural or a window? It's a window. The, the heavens declare the glory of God. So um, I'm reading something. Um, um, I'm, God is invisible. He's the invisible God. I cannot see him. And so he shows me, um, he shows me himself through the things that have been made, his divine majesty, his glory. So that's my duty is to, the thicker it is, the better I can see through it, is my. It's a misleading word, isn't it? Thick. Thick. <laughs> yeah. The thicker but, it is, the better I can see through it. Most people wouldn't go there. Right. But I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to, why, why does increased thickness increase transparency? Um, Increased thickness, if I see it as thick as a gift from God, the more God lays it on, the thicker God makes it. And I see that, the more grateful I can be. The more grateful I can be, the more I'm linked to the giver of the gift. So this, this whole thing is wrapped up in how do I respond rightly to the gifts that the giver gives. 
Now, we all know that if, if a kid receives a gift for a Christmas present and then snatches it out of his mother's hands and then runs back to his bedroom to play with it, he is separating the gift from the giver and focusing on the gift. And that's what our consumerist, materialistic society does. We snatch things from God's hand and run off, ne never say thank you, and run off and try to en enjoy them. And so that's one problem. But the other problem, the thing I'm trying, to, I'm trying to resist, is when you have the super spiritual kid who the parents have shopped for uh, the, just the right present, present and, the, and they give the present, Christmas present to the child, and the child sets the, doesn't unwrap it, just sets it aside and say, thank you so much for shopping for me, thank you for the present, whatever it is, but I just want to spend time with you. So you, you got a lot of those people in Moscow? <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, I would say that the world is full of them, yes. I, I think there are people who want to separate the giver and the gift, and the consumerist world wants the gift without the giver, and I think far fewer, but I think that there are a number of people who want the, who want the giver, and they are very, very nervous about the gifts. They, they just, they, they don't know what to do with them. They, they set them aside, and Oh, thank you for this, but I, I, I can't think about how much I like it because I don't want to forget Jesus. I, I suppose that would be a difference in tone is that that's just not my perception of the world I live in, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people like that. I think most of the people in my church and in this city are very happy to receive gifts and spend all their time thinking about them and playing with them and uh, are, are almost never setting them aside for Jesus' sake, uh, as wrong as that might be. No, I think, th I think you're right that that we almost never set them aside. But I think there are many people who feel guilty for not setting them aside. Okay, that, that's closer to reality, perhaps. So, um, first of all, the agreement is, 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 the more we talk about this at the principial level, the more agreement there is, because we're just Bible guys, you know, that's the reason. And the Bible's pretty clear that he has given us all things richly to enjoy and, and uh, woe to those, he says some pretty nasty things about those who forbid marriage and food because these were given for your enjoyment that, and they are to be sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So clearly that little unit there in the pastorals is to show a paradigm for how to take the thickness of the world and to turn it into an act of worship. Mm -hmm. Here's another difference though. Um, you're focusing on gratitude as the remedy for how increased thickness becomes more transparent. The, 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 the bigger, better the benefit of a material thing, or just the goodness, doesn't have to be material, I suppose, just created life. Um, the richer, deeper, stronger the gratitude, and hence God getting more glory. That's almost never my emphasis. Um, that's probably an overstatement. My emphasis is constantly on enjoying God as God, delighting in God, delight yourself in the Lord, and then I try to fit in stuff and, and, and ask how that works. Not, not everybody should live for gratitude. I'm not a good Calvin guy there. But, and, and, then, and then how do you fit in stuff? Easy. You know, it's just easy. That's what you do with gifts. You say thank you. But if I'm, if I'm on to the Trinity, right, that the Father is not thankful for the Son and the Son for the Father. He, he is thrilled, satisfied, delighting in, enjoying, enraptured by, stunned with, amazed with, admiring. Ayn Rand said, <laughs> let's quote Ayn Rand. Now there's a transition for you. <laughs> Admiration is the highest and most rare pleasure. And with, for her, that was an absolute mockery of humanity. Uh, it's true, <laughs> I think. Uh, we were made to admire, mainly, not mainly to be gr grateful. Grateful is essential. According to Romans 1, you can't have God without it. And if you lack it, you don't honor him. It is a way of honoring God. But at the core of my system, and this is, this is why we're wrestling with this a little differently, I think, is... I am leaning on people, not mainly to be thankful for their stuff, but to delight in God if they don't have any stuff. And then, because that's, that's what happens at death, Paul, and, and we're going to get it all back. I believe in the new heavens and new earth. Then I'll be suited to really handle thickness. 
Um, but but for now, the, to just me... Just practice now, though. Yes, oh, absolutely we yeah. practice now. But what's the biggest threat? Now, you see, you're operating with the threat that, that people are rejecting their gifts, and I'm operating with the threat that people are in love with their gifts, and they're idolizing their gifts, and they love them way too much. And so I'm on a crusade to show a God up here that is more satisfying, more beautiful than what the gifts can give. That's a different model than gratitude issue. Then I ask so what is a sunrise for? And the answer is to reflect the majesty, glory, beauty of God so that when you see it and feel rising up within you, and I don't think it's much of an intellectual process here, delight. I mean, Psalm 19 says the sun comes up and it's just like a bridegroom. It's like it's joy. He's crossing the sky. And I think the point there is you see it, I'm happy too. Son, you're happy. I'm happy. We're happy. Because, because God is, and, and for, the, for the spiritual soul, the thickness is transparent. The, the sun is majestic. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It's working in me. It's making me happy. And it's becoming transparent. And it's God, God, God. So I labor, and, and the closest I've gotten is, is the Augustine quote, he loves thee too little, this is a prayer, who loves anything together with thee which he loves not for thy sake. So Augustine is not working with a gratitude model there. He's working with a, a sovereign joy model there. And that, that, that may be... So yeah, I'd like to tag something onto that. Yeah. Um, first, we agree that the priority in, in our responses to God, we agree that worship and adoration precedes gratitude. So um, the admiration, the praise for God um, is senior in your, in your prayers I think is senior in your prayers to the thank yous for the, the things he's given you. I think we agree there. But even with admiration, what the, and maybe this is another area where I would not mark myself down as disagreeing, but just mark me down as nervous. I, I don't know that we have the, the ability to enter into the heavenlies and sort of tap into God raw, right? I, I believe that we... Um, we need a mediator, and of course we can do this in Jesus' name, but there's a way of going, seeking to get detached from everything and then sort of accessing him raw. I think that God writes our lessons for us in big block letters. He gives us the Bible, he gives us the world, and, and so on. So I want to use my primers. I want to use the things that he's given me so that I can approach him appropriately. So when the Bible talks about worship, worshiping God, admiring God, um, very rarely does the Bible, it, it, it's not like this is um, excluded because it is there in the Bible, but admiration for God, worship of God, praise for God is overwhelmingly connected to his mighty works, things he's done in history, his deliverance of it. And it could be slopped over with gratitude. You know, you've, um, we, your, your works or your deeds are mighty. The Bible doesn't spend a lot of time, there's some, but doesn't spend a lot of time working through Stephen Charnock's um, systematics on these attributes of God. We don't have chapter after chapter on omniscience and chapter after chapter on omnipresence and chapter after, we, we don't have that. We have his mighty works, what he did to Pharaoh, what he did to Egypt, what he did, you know. So this tells me, I, I believe what Charnock is saying, I, I, have no, I don't have a beef against the system, systematicians. But we are not mature enough to, to go there yet. I believe in the resurrection we will be a lot more able to do that. But I want to exult in what God has done in this world, in history, in my life, and, and, and then realize that I'm being invited further up and further in. It's, there, will, there will come a time when we will, we will be more able to exult in God as he is. But I, I'm still in kindergarten, <laughs> and I'm, I, don't ready, I don't feel like I'm ready for graduate school physics yet. Right. But I, I totally agree. I totally agree. In fact, I don't think we'll ever get there. Right. 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 We're always going to be finite, and he's always going to be infinite. Uh, we're always going to be material. Always going to be what? Material. Material, The new yes. heavens, the new earth, new body will be a material body of a spiritual kind. Yes. He has locked himself into materiality, it seems to me, in the incarnation, in the Godhead. Forever, now. So right. I, I'm totally yes. there. I'm, we're just posing the questions slightly differently. Let me, let me ask this. This might be clarifying. Um, 
bring it on. You know, I want my people to, I don't, I don't tend to send them out uh, saying, solve your uh, spiritual communion problem with God by, by minimizing, lessening, thinning, uh, make the th- soup thicker and the celebration richer. And, but we agreed the other day, I think, and so just talk for a minute about the role of self-denial because here, here's my, my experience, and I think it's biblical, for the sake of maximum enjoyment of all that God has made, too much of it is bad for you. Oh, yeah. Yes, abs- absolutely. Um, if, if we want to embrace the good life under Christ, under the Lordship of Christ, one of the first things that you should learn, one of the first things your parents should teach you, is that self-denial is not done for the sake of self-denial. Self-denial is done for the sake of a right enjoyment, a balanced enjoyment. If, if you, your kids go out to the mall with money in their pockets and they will not be content unless they came home having purchased something, something's wrong. It's, it's not whatever, whatever it was they purchased is not the problem. The fact that they had to purchase it, that's the problem. If someone is incapable of saying no, whether it's to, to food or to sex or to music or what, you know, whatever, they, they just don't have any breaks on this thing. Um, eventually, the thing that they're idolizing is going to be something that they lose. Um, you know, alcoholics don't enjoy wine the way they ought to. Um, people who are addicted to sexual compulsions don't enjoy sex the way they ought to. You lose the thing you idolize. It, it comes apart. It comes apart in your hands. So self-denial is not for the sake of self-denial. Se- self-denial is for the sake of a right, rightly ordered relationship to God and pleasure and goodness and so on. Right. So I, th- I think your statement... Um, you just qualified that it's of no use in killing the lusts of the flesh to move in the direction of asceticism. Right. You just qualified that, didn't you? I, I, yes. Um, when, when Paul is talking in Colossians where he says, uh, um, why do you submit to decrees saying, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? He says these things have, an appear, uh, have the appearance of wisdom, but he says they're of no value in checking fleshly indulgence. Obviously, self-denial, the, the, the thing that he was talking about, the asceticism he's talking about there in that context has no value in checking fleshly indulgence. Godly discipline uh, uh, under the rule of Christ, done for the right reason not to put yourself in with him and not, you know, uh, godly, uh, godly denial, self-denial is of great value in checking fleshly indulgence. But asceticism by itself is as much a temptation as consumerism. So that, that, that's my point. If it's under well, Christ, it's... That, d- 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 it's as bad a temptation. Do you mean it's as much a temptation? Well, it depends well, on who you are. I mean Americans. Just say Americans. Like these people right here. I don't think they're tempted towards asceticism nearly as much as they're tempted toward materialism. Um, there are two ways you can... Um, this goes back to a comment I made earlier. Some people, um, some people actually embrace a lot. You know, they go to the mission, they give it all away, they go to the mission field, and some of them are doing it for healthy, honorable, uh, godly reasons. The same way that my father's generation went off and the fought in the war. There was incredible sacrifices, not because they were it was an end in itself, but because that's what it took to get this job done. And there are many godly people going to the mission field for that same reason. But there are other people going, denying everything, giving up everything, going to the mission field because they're trying to, they're trying to wrestle with their junk. They're, they're, they've got, I mean, I'm too, uh, I'm too messed up. And, and there are people who believe, and I've read a lot of the, the, um, the, the Jim Wallace um, Sojourner's wing of the church. You own something, you have a problem. If they think of life as a zero-sum game. If you've got more, that means somebody else has less, and he has less because you have more. I think that that's a misunderstanding of how economics works. So there are people who either give it all up for the wrong reason, you know, they, they go to the mission field and die for, for the wrong reason, not, set, not taking anything away from those who do it for the right reason. And then there are all the people who remain with all their stuff. They remain with their white uh, suburban middle class values, but they feel like they're class B Christians. They they don't they don't get to the point of making that surrender, but they've accepted the obligation that they ought to 
be. And so they're, they're falling between two stools. They keep all the stuff and they walk around with guilt because, because of it. They, they, and they feel like, oh, um, and, and so you, I've been in evangelical circles my whole life. You're flipping through a magazine, you see a picture of a starving kid. You could, for the, cup of, uh, the price of a cup of coffee a day, save this child from starvation. Or you could turn the page, you jerk. You know. and, and if you turn the page, you're, you're under condemnation. So what do you do? You, you have guilt-motivated giving instead of gratitude-motivated giving. If, I'm, if I receive blessings and I give out of gratitude, I'm going to give as much as I can for as long as I can for the rest of my life. If I give out of guilt, what am I going to give? I'm going to give just enough to make the guilt go away, which usually works out to about 20 bucks. I, so I want to bring in a couple of quotes here and see if that does anything. Um, here's a, here's just from these, these blog posts that you did interacting with it. Um, you're talking about the integration between gift, giver, vertical, horizontal, enjoyment. Um, this kind of integration will prevent dislocations from arising in families that are sold out to the glory of God. Integration will keep our neighbor, wife, husband, kids from feeling like a means to an end. There's a delicate balance here, and that's what we're trying to discuss is with this balance. You say this, but God is most glorified in me when I love what he has given to me for its own sake. This is teleologically related to the macro point of God's glory being overall, of course, but we still have to enjoy what he gives, flat out, period, stop. Now, I'll throw that over to you first, um, and, and then, because I think that that's, you're, you're saying no, n- not flat out, period, stop. If you do flat out, period, stop, you're, you're an atheist. You're an atheist. There you go. That would be bad. Um, and so, and so I, so I want to say, you're, you're, gonna, you're rejecting where he goes in that sense, um, but does that then mean that our neighbors, wife, husband, kids um, should feel, are, are they in fact, uh, and I don't know if merely is the right word, means to an end? In other words, I love you, honey. I love you, children. I love you, neighbor. I love you, food, um, merely as means to an end. Um, and, and does that then, what does that do to those relationships? So I just wanted you to comment on, on the, how, do you, how are you navigating that? If you, if you want to reject where Doug's going in, one, in, in that emphasis on flat out period stop, right. how does the means end thing work? Right. Um, here's, here's the way I have thought about it. Um, why is my Christian hedonism not offensive if I am motivated to help someone or bless someone because it makes me happy. Well, I back up and I say, what makes me happy is seeing more of God, knowing more of God, loving more of God. Um, And that happiness enlarges when it is shared by others. My enjoyment of God in your enjoyment of God through my enjoyment of God on your behalf makes mine bigger. So, I come to you desiring that I will get my joy bigger in your blessing. If somebody says to me, why isn't that manipulation? Why isn't that means and why aren't you using me? And my answer is because the way you enlarge my joy is by sharing in my joy in God's joy, which is the greatest thing you could ever know. The way you will make me glad is if you are glad in God. And your being glad in God is the highest gladness you could ever have. So if my finding more joy in your being more glad in God looks manipulative to you, call it what you will. That's what I'm after. I'm after my maximum joy in your maximum joy in God. Okay, so what I hear there is uh, your joy uh, our, our joys don't cancel each other out, no. right? So the greater that mine goes in God, the greater yours is going to go in God, especially if you some, have some part in making that happen. So, that, so that's not a zero, this is not a zero-sum game like right. you were talking about. Yes, so, but now, see, I, I really haven't answered your question. That, that's, that's the way I, I'm constantly trying to figure out how my motivation of love is not manipulative. But the, the question you asked, I think, would go back to pleasure in your children, pleasure in your wife, not doing them good necessarily. 
I'm not on, they're sick, how can I make them well? But rather, they're, they're the, there's a, who they are, and how can I be happy about that? Right, yeah, and, and, and enjoy but that. But there is a we, part of it, I think, where your, like, this is what we've been talking about, I think, in your talk on, that first talk you did uh, the other day, um, your delight in your children, simply considered, I love you, son, I love you, daughter, um, is good for them. It, you are doing good to them simply as fathers expressing it delight. Is, but, okay. but I'm just dealing with his stop. Okay. Right. Delight in your wife, stop. Right. And, and I'm saying uh, my wife would, should want me to say the Augustine quote, right. that you delight in me because you see in me reflections of, evidences of, traits of God. There are evidences of God in my character, and there's evidence of God's power and creativity and wisdom in the way he's made my face and my body and my personality. And if I weren't that, you wouldn't love me as much, dear, as you love me. Right. You would not love me, dear, so much. It loved you not honor more. Uh, and it's, I, I've always taken that loveless poem and just say, love you not God more. Now, let me, I'd like to agree, agree with that and then take this opportunity to distance myself from atheism. Uh, <laughs> in, that, in that quote you read, you said, this is, we acknowledge the, teleolo the overarching teleological coherence of all things in Christ. Um, in other words, I agree with the Augustine quote, everything coheres in Christ, everything converges on Christ, everything finds its meaning and purpose in him. So that, that's, we, we agree with that. That's what I meant by the, teleolo uh, the teleology of the thing. So what did I mean by focus, period, stop? You know, what, what did I mean by that? Um, and this has to do with the psychology of the thing. It doesn't have to do with the abstract theology of the thing. It doesn't have to do with how I, how I would answer questions about my life and my responses and my reasons for going and doing this in a setting like this. If someone said, why did you start a school for your children and why did you do these things and, and why did you do that other thing, I would hope that my answers would always come back to Christ. That, because this is, we're, we're reflecting on our lives and we're looking down on our lives sort of detached and we're looking at years and decisions at the, you know, from a, from a higher perspective. The way I'd illustrate it is this. Suppose we're in this room and we hear the screech of tires and a crash and someone says a little, little girl's been hurt out here, a car wreck, and we all run out there. And suppose I'm thinking at the time, this is great. I'm full of compassion. Look how fast I'm running. I'm running faster than everybody else. Um, I'm wanting to get there first. I'm full of, I'm overflowing. I'm full of compassion. Well, if I were doing that, I'd be full of something all right. But it, <laughs> but it, would, it wouldn't be compassion because we are finite. And because we're finite, if I'm doing a math problem, I, can, I have to think about the math problem. I can't think about the math problem and Jesus. Or if I'm, if I'm in an emergency, if I'm running into a burning building to get, rescue someone, I'm not thinking about the, the schematic diagram of the theology of the, of the thing. Uh, I'm loving my neighbor, which means that I'm not doing theology about loving my neighbor. If I'm, so go back to this car accident. If I'm, running, if, if I'm running out there thinking about anything except that little girl, then I don't have love. I've got, in order to love my neighbor, I've got to be, to be loving my neighbor. Now, if I step out of that later and, and someone asks me request, uh, questions about it, I can take that finite human act that I experienced as a total, uh, as a, 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 a horizontal totality at the moment. That's, that's, what, that's all I was thinking about. But I was thinking about it in a certain way because of my Christian upbringing, because I've been prepared myself beforehand to respond in a certain way. All of those things are true, and I could reflect on them afterwards, after the point. But if I, if I come to my child and say, you know, uh, uh, to one of my daughters, let's say their little daughter, and I say, I love you with everything I've got because Jesus is making me, you know, um, that is not going to fly as well as... If I just say I love you, if I'm laughing in my now it's my grandkids, if I if one of the toddlers is toddling around the living room and I'm just in, enjoying it, stop. All right. All I'm describing I'm not describing a worldview there. I'm simply describing a moment there, and I think that it's the stop that makes that moment potent in that relationship. Now, 
when I'm teaching my children or grandchildren or whatever later, I would, I, when marriage seminars, I, I say, if your wife is number one in your life, she's going to get short, shortchanged. You know, Christ has to be number one. If she's number two, she's going to get more love than she would if she were number one. If you make an idol out of your kids or your grandkids or your family and put them in the position of number one in the ultimate, then you're going to rob everybody because you've detached yourself from the source of all love, which means that you can't love, you can't love them. But when I'm connected to the source of all love, I can only think about so many things at a time, at a, and I've got to focus on what I'm doing, and, and, and uh, hopefully I've positioned that beforehand so that it's operating in a Christian framework. Okay, so what, so what I hear there is you're saying, um, and I think in one of the posts you mentioned something about anchor points. Christian, anchor points, yeah, yes. cre Creatures need anchor points. And so if you're thinking about the moment, it's okay to do full stop, provided that there's these um, periodic, regular, um, I, think you, I think you used, you know, Sunday morning worship and then sort of daily quiet time type examples mm -hmm. where you're going directly, immediately Godward. So I'm going vertical, I'm thinking about God, I'm in, the, I'm in the worship moment. And then if those are there, then I'm sort of freed to engage with my wife, engage with my kids, so forth, full stop just boom, because it's punctuated by these directly Godward moments. Um, and so the, when I think about that, the analogy I think of is when I'm eating dinner and I, I pray before the meal and I commend the time to God and our, our fellowship to God, and then I just eat and talk. Um, and, then, and then afterward, I think, man, that was great. Thank you, Lord, for the for that, for that time. Those, those are the anchor points. Those, so there's anchor points at the front and the back end. So I just wanted to, to say, okay, that little model there to you and, and maybe in the context of things that you've said about um, drinking orange juice to the glory of God and those sort of just daily, like, does that require me to every time I take a sip, go up, go up, go up? Or is there this sort of yeah. momentary? Doug, in distancing himself from that possibility, um, I think uses um, character or straw man. Uh, I love you because he made me. Nobody's suggesting that. That's a straw man. That's, that, that's not what we're talking about, coercion versus authenticity. That's not the issue. Nor is the issue here, I love you. That's a fair point. That's good. I love you, and I need to add that uh, God made you. I don't think verbally, that's the issue. That's not the issue, whether you need to verbalize that. The issue in that quote with the full stop is, where does our delight terminate? Now, I think psychologically you're making a totally valid point. Given my finitude and my fallenness and my selfishness and my materiality, uh, all, all kinds of in, 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 um, finiteness, I think that's right. You, you cannot probably do a geometry problem or design things and, and be consciously God-focused all the time. Now, my, my question is, in saying that that would be a good thing, I think I'm saying something true. And that I suspect that a as we... A good thing if you could do it if at you could the same do it, time. If you could do it. If I could be God-focused and you-focused simultaneously and God-focused in you, the you-ness, the thickness of the you would not thin out in my being God-focused. I would see God and see you for all that he made you. And I think what maturity in Christ is now, and what we will be in the age to come probably means those won't be have to kept, be kept as separate as they are now. So I'm just agreeing that the limitations that are on us now are there, and, and that's reality. No, every sip, uh, not a conscious thank you. Uh, it won't work because you're probably talking to your wife or thinking about your work or something else. But I, I don't regard that as a necessary virtue to be pursued. It's just a reality. And the more I can help people toward who knows what level of God consciousness, simultaneous with any given enjoyment of natural things, mm -hmm. I want to take them there. So if, there's a difference, right, between saying, because you said, you know, that, that the fact that we have to go Godward and then downward and Godward and horizontal, um, you, you use two different words, and I think it probably matters which one it's owing to. If it's owing to our finitude, our creatureliness, 
then it seems like it's just sort of a feature of our existence that's never going to go away no matter how big we get in the age to come. If it's a function of our sin, then it's something that I need to repent of. Yeah, and I stumbled because I'm not sure. Uh, included infinitude, I simply meant bodies as we have them now, minds as we have them now. I don't know what the resurrection body and mind will be capable of, but I'm inclined to think they'll be capable of um, more God-saturatedness in our thinking and seeing than we have now. I, and I agree with that. And I, I would agree, provided it's not the kind of discipline anchor points where I need to touch base in this fallen world, in my body, I need to touch base periodically. You know, we say grace before meals. We begin each day with prayer. We, we touch home base to remind ourselves as I go through this next stretch, and then we touch base again. Let's imagine a mature saint in this life before the resurrection who's lived in such a way that they're God-saturated. It's not, you won't have the sense that they're touching base so much as that Christ's presence pervades the, the whole. But the, the one other comment, you know, this dear brother Martin Luther again, one, he observed somewhere that he, he discovered that it was impossible to, to give himself to prayers while he was making love to his wife. And, and I, I can't believe you even tried. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, there's... There's you really want to go there? <laughs> yeah. He, he did. What did you I mean? I just, you invited him. Yeah. I'm a, Depends I'm, on how long it lasts. <laughs> yeah. So, if, um, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Don't, never start something like and that. And we're done. No. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't start. I told you you didn't want to go there. It's all folks. <laughs> so, if, um, so, so with, with Martin Luther, what you've got is this idea of, of, um, touching base, sort of formal, uh, formal connection, formal invocation. Conscious. Like conscious. Conscious, intentional uh, God word. But I don't think anybody has any quarrel. I, I, I can't see how anyone who loved God would have any quarrel with someone who is living in the fruit of the Spirit all the time, all the time. And when they're brought to their senses and asked a direct question, was Christ involved in that? Well, well yes, of course. Um, but it's not... Um, it's not the formal anchor point. When, when, so when we're talking about growth and maturity, the God-saturatedness, which I hope that we will have in the resurrection, is not. we're not going to be, I don't think, having to stop every seven times a day in the resurrection to remind ourselves that we're still Christians. So, okay, so here's a, here's a question that's related to these sort of things, and then we're run, running close to time. Uh, we've got about 30 more minutes, and I want to get to one or two other issues. But... Um, but this is like a, a kind of a more pastoral, practical question related to all of these things. And so I wonder how you would deal with this situation. You have someone, faithful Christian in your church, who comes to you and says, okay, I'm, I'm sold on Christian hedonism, sold on God's passion for his glory, all, all of Christ for all of life. And so I know that God loves me, enjoys me, delights in me for his glory. I know that he loves me, delights in me, and enjoys me for the sake of Christ, who is my righteousness. I, I know that. But does he just love me for me? So, so they, they, they're giving you the macro points. They're giving you the, you know, I know all of that, but is there a sense, any sense in which just me as I am, does he just love me for me? Or maybe even a better way to put it would be, does he like me? Does, is he, um, does he think my personality's enjoyable? Does he delight in me? And, and, I, and I, the reason I think about it that way is because I look at my, so my sons, I've got two little boys, and I look at them and think, I, I love them overarching for the sake of uh, the glory of God. I hope and pray that I, one day I'll love them as brothers. Um, but I like their personalities. I enjoy them for them in that sense. And, I'm, and so I'm wondering, I see how that relates father to son, humanly speaking. Is there an analog in that? Is that a picture of some sort between the way that God thinks about me? Because I think that there's a pastoral question that people are coming. They're not trying to be man-centered. They're not trying to put me at the center of the universe. They just want to know, does God enjoy me and like me? And, and so maybe I'll, I don't, whoever wants to go first can go first. But how would you talk to that person? The reason you can delight in your sons for themselves is because you're not delighting in your own work. So when, when God delights in us, it's, we, are not, um, we are not independent of him or his will or his predestination. or uh, Everything that he's delighting in is 
comes back, as you point out, to his own glory and his own pleasure for his own purpose, his, the good purpose of his, his will. So this goes back to the previous discussion. I'm finite. I'm limited. I can just get a blast out of one of my grandkids just doing, because I'm watching something that I didn't do. I'm partly responsible upstream a number of years ago, but th this is... Um, you this, there again. What, I didn't. You guys didn't. <laughs> um, so so I, I'm this child's ancestor, so, but I'm not doing all this stuff. I can just delight in it and delight in it in the moment for its own sake. But that has to do with my finitude and my, limit, my limitations. But when God delights in us, he rejoices over us with singing. The, um, there's more joy, Luke, it says, there's more joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Uh, that pre in the presence of angels, that's God's joy. God, God is rejoicing over the sinner who repents. But God who rejoices over the repentant sinner is rejoicing in his own work, in his, in his own wisdom. So that's at least a, a distinction that should be factored in. Um, two things. The second one will be more pastoral first more exegetical in, in Ephesians 5 we are being uh, made beautiful because we are his body we are being made beautiful so that he can delight in us because we are him I, I think that text is one of the most amazingly Christ is the hedonist in Ephesians 5 and he's making a, a wife that he can delight in because he will conform her into his image and make her a perfect reflection of himself. And so with Romans 8. So I think that's agreeing with what, what you said. Now, here's the person comes to me and says, does he delight in me just, and you can, their, their voice is wavering, just because of me. Because they've just heard a sermon that's big and global and, and uh, all about the glory of God. I think I would put my hand on her arm because it's it is usually a her for me anyway, uh, and I would say, what 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 would be the opposite of that? What what would what are you feeling you're gonna? What's what's it? I want to dig in there a little bit because operating at the theoretical level at that moment is <laughs> I got a theoretical answer to that question. That's not I don't think what she's after. At least she, she didn't know quite. I, I want to know, what's the opposite of that for you? And, and she'll probably start talking about some experiences and some, which I'll be able to affirm, probably. Mm -hmm. Things that she needs, wants, that are not evil. And go there. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, answer, the answer is, uh, God is God. And you may not yet be at the point where you are most happy that he's God. Your deepest happiness should be that God is God and that you get to know him and admire him. This is eternal life, that you know me, you know God, the Father, and, and him of his son. And, and you still are so wounded from your upbringing that you believe right now your deepest need is for God to be uh, affirming of who you are. It feels like the absolute gigantic need emotionally right now. So I want to go there and affirm all that I can about what God will do about that. He's caring, he's attentive, he's loving, he's a wise, uh, he's, he's a there father. But I do want to take her beyond that. I want her in the end to get to the point where there's a robustness about her soul that says, you know, come hell or high water, God is God. And though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And she's not there. She's just not there. And so giving her, you know, just a quick theoretical answer is not going to help her. So pastorally, that would be my effort. I, I agree with that. And, and I would distinguish the two questions. You said, does God like me? And does God care about me for me? Uh, I would answer those two in this setting. Pastorally, I think that John's right. That there's something else going on there. But... If someone asks, does God like us? Does God, I would say, of course. If God says, does God care about me for me? I'd say, of course not, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, you know, this is huge. This is worth lingering another one minute on. Um, theologically and experientially, most of us probably, generalization, walk with a sense of God's disapproval. 
Theologically, it's based on the fact that he's perfect and I'm not, and he doesn't like sin, and I commit it regularly. None of my attitudes is without some element of flaw. God is perfect, therefore he is always, I think this is a true statement, always looking upon me with disapproval. <laughs> and and if, if you stop there, that is the most oppressive, impossible, discouraging, blank way to live. You're not going to look at any clouds if you're feeling that all, all day. If God should mark iniquities, who could stand? Right. So, now what? So, Hebrews 12, um, God um, disciplines those whom he loves. And so, our lives, I think, are shot through with God's disciplines because of things he disapproves of in our life as a father. But, and this is, this is where Noel and I have just gone pretty deep trying to work through these things for each other. God never, ever, though he disapproves of any bad attitude that I have, he never looks upon me with contempt. He never looks upon me with contempt. And as I think of my fatherhood and its failures, that distinction I often fail to make. The disapproval of my child's behavior here is, is, I observe it, they feel it. They know daddy doesn't like this attitude. Daddy didn't like what I just did. Now, am I at that moment, or have I set up such an atmosphere that they don't feel contempt from me? That, that disapproval, is, I want both hands, I need both hands. Uh, that that, that disapproval is couched, is swallowed up in this singing over me and dying for me and purchasing me and planting me in his son and conforming me to his image. All that grand, redemptive, affirming, delighting work can exist simultaneously with a God who is infinitely perfect and whose standards are infinitely high and therefore never met in this life. That's really hard for our people to get. It's hard for me to get. And, and yet, I think, and it's I don't why, know what. And it's why justification is so crucial. That's helpful. Um, I think that that was a longer session than I, than I anticipated, but I think it was really good. And there's, a, there's one or two other issues that I'd like to explore. So this is a kind of a one 90 degree turn here for a minute. Um, and, uh, and it has to do with um, engaging broader issues outside the church, public square, so it's just stuff, with bo which both of you do. Um, and, uh, and so I have kind of two, two questions in it. Um, one is, John, you've, you, do, you speak into certain public square issues, most notably, I think, uh, racial harmony and uh, the pro-life uh, uh, movement, you know, sermons every year for the past 20 some odd years. Um, but it's largely, those are the ones that, that are sort of your issues that you speak to. Doug, on the other hand, you are um, all over the map. Right, your, but your blog, you, even sermons, um, you know everything from uh, you know taxation, national debt, climate change, what have you. It's it's it shows up there. Um, so I'm just wondering if you guys could give any reflections on for pastors and maybe for Christians more broadly, perhaps, but mainly pastors. Is there a is there a reason or is there a is one of those models better? Is it just you guys are different, and so different ministries, and so, you know, Lord bless you, right hand of fellowship, and off you go? How, how do we think about that, that you kind of go deep in one or two issues that are really big, and, and you're willing to speak? You'll say that those are, you know, that, that you know, pro-life issues at the top of your, your list, but you're, you're doing a lot more. So I would say that I, I feel constrained to address all these other issues. There's so many shenanigans and corruptions and evil in so many areas, I feel constrained to address them, but I, I believe with all my heart it's because people, the country was not listening to the sorts of things that John has been saying all these years. So if, if you prophetically address certain key issues and people respond at a certain, at, at the time, in the moment, you're not going to have to deal with downstream corruptions that you know, the, the, the things that are going on in Washington, D.C. now would have astounded uh, our fathers. You know, just uh, Christian, non-Christian, Democrat, Republican, they would have just, uh, they would have been totally flummoxed at the trillions of dollars that we are stealing from our 
uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren. It's evil. It's a moral issue. Um, so I address it because it's a more. I address those things because they're moral issues. I don't believe I'm getting into politics. I believe that the state is getting into breaking every one of the Ten Commandments, and when the civil government comes over onto my turf, I'm a preacher, these are the commandments of God. Uh, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you should, you know, all of these things that they're enshrined, they're redefining marriage, which is a violation of the prohibition of adultery. You, you, you name, they're working, they claim to be God, they claim, all of these things are necessary for us to address, and then we have to do the spade work and the thinking that's, that goes to that, but that's, I believe that there's certain root issues that uh, anybody who addresses in principle any one of those issues from the pulpit is preserving the prophetic prerogative that I think the church must maintain for itself. So I I've, I've have nothing but appreciation and respect for what John's done. I would say just do so more and more, and that's, that's what we need because that's, the, that's where the principle is. If John the Baptist rebukes Herod for taking his brother's wife, I don't have any complaints against John the Baptist for not address, addressing other things that Herod may have done, and I have no doubt that there were some. There's really a, a simple and very encouraging answer, I think, from my orientation. There's a principial one, but I would be flattering myself to, to say that it's the reason. Uh, I'll tell you it anyway. Um, I'm often, in reading news and blogs, tempted to make snide comments about the world uh, and its folly on Twitter in particular. And I've just resolved it would dilute what I think Twitter should be for me. So I've just resolved keep Twitter Godward. Um, and, and here's the real reason. Doug is smarter than I am. <laughs> and and, and in, this, in this regard, he, he's, he, he reads more and remembers more. I, I don't understand the world. I really don't understand the national debt. I try to read it. And I say, I don't have time to read this stuff. John, I, that's not your problem. That's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you Tr understand trillions, it. Trillions you is a big you number. understand it enough to, to, to see a real moral issue and where it is. Frankly, I don't know. I, I just say, okay, if, if I did that with my house, uh, that would be a bad idea. You know, I said, don't borrow that. But... On, on, on issue after issue, I read you, and I'm thankful. So I'm not picking on you either. I'm thankful for your perceptivity. You have read more. You have thought more. You understand more. And therefore, you can comment on more with integrity. If I tried to go from issue to issue to comment, I'd have to take a two or three weeks sabbatical and, and read a book or two and then study some history. And, and then I might feel safe to understand this political orientation and why this doesn't work. And so this is supposed to be encouraging. I really feel the reason my life is as narrow, simple, straightforward on a few things as it is, is because I'm a pretty limited guy. I, I left at the academic world largely because of my limitations academically, my reading limitations, my memory limitations, like J.C. Ryle. Okay, here's a big example. I dumped on you an hour and nine minutes of J.C. Ryle, and you would say, goodness gracious, he had lots of quotes, and he knows lots about J.C. Ryle. You know what? In one year, I won't be able to tell you one sentence of what I said. He, standing here a year from now, would be able to remember lots of quotes that I gave you, probably. I watched him do it up here. He's not taking any notes while the speakers are down there. He's sitting there, and he's quoting back to him what they said up here. I can't remember what they said. So we're just dealing with know who you are. Know who, who you are, light a torch, and stick it in that oven. You know, just, just take that little that thing that you are and, and just stop trying to be Piper or Wilson out there and, and just and flame that thing that you are for Jesus' sake. So, so really, I think if, if I could read as much as you read and remember as much as you remember, I would really make a pain of myself in the political sphere. Amen. Oh, um, no, I think, okay, good. So, so it is just, a, it's different gifts, different callings. And, and so we, we can, so then, then the, the, the second issue, and, and I wanted to bring this up because I think 
the first time you guys met, I think, was about 10 years ago at a League in Your Conference, and you were sitting on a panel, something like this, and you said something like, you said something to him like, you know, I just wish there were more tears um, coming out of what I, out of Moscow, and you looked back at him and said, if you only knew how much we were holding back, and and so, um, and then, so that's 10 years ago, and then last June, this is, I, I remember seeing this kind of in the, there's two blog posts, one you did and one you did, and I remember thinking, that's a good pairing for this sort of event. Um, it was during the uh, Gay Pride Month, and they were doing the march and all that sort of stuff, and you wrote a post, and the title of the post was something like, um, My Eyes Shed Streams of Tears, Thoughts on the New Calamity, and you started talking about um, the institutionalization, the governor attended the, the march, and so just the embrace by the establishment of this of homosexuality and gay marriage and so forth and that lifestyle. And you just said, um, my reason for writing is to help the church feel the sorrow of these days. In our best moments, we weep for the world. So, so you did that. Meanwhile, you know, right over on the World Wide Web, if it's possible for a man to put a fruit plate on his head, and it is, and it's also possible for him to deck his tan little body out in leather and oil, and it is, and possible for him to gyrate that little body on a float cruising down Main Street, USA, and it is, then we should consider three possible responses and reject another one, and, you, and it got better from there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and so there, you know, um, phrases like, uh, you know, fruity contributions from the homo hipsters, um, the femi flannery fanboys, uh, militant homos, pomo poofters, these, all this sort of, you know, you know, what they'll say. I was holding back. Yeah, no, I know, right. I, I know. So, you know, one's an accident, two's a trend, three's a problem. Um, and so I'm just, I'm looking at that going, weeping tears because of this and uh, mocking. And so I just want to, so 10 years on or so, since you guys kind of got to know each other, this is maybe a good place to end. And just, I just like to hear thoughts on that. You know, is, is, are those good, both good models, different models? What, what should, how should we think about reading and engaging with, with that? I'd like, I'd like to go first on that. Okay. The, the, um, the, John's response uh, is one that I uh, am in sympathy with, am grateful for. I believe that um, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Paul said that uh, with tears that many are enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, I believe that the body of Christ at large must show compassion for these people who are like sheep without a shepherd, and they're and it's just a dis, it's a disaster. Um, and so I have zero objection to John's response, and I have similar responses also in in our ministry when I'm when I'm preaching. I've there are there have been plenty of plenty of times where I've encountered that kind of thing or, or um, responded that way. I have no objections to it, whatever. There's a difference between in my in my thinking, and this is what I tried to lay out in the serrated edge. I don't believe that uh, satire is a one size fits all response. I, I believe it's appropriate in some cases and totally inappropriate in others. Um, you don't. You don't mock people in their grief. You don't mock people in their pain. If 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 you're dealing with human wreckage, you don't you don't do that. But when you're dealing with priests of Baal who are dancing around an altar, cutting themselves with knives, and saying that they're gonna, if you're dealing with the people who are doing the gay pride parade thing, you're dealing with a certain kind of you're dealing with a certain level of arrogance and insolence and and hubris that. The last thing in the world they want to hear is someone, um, uh, I think in that post I said, the last thing they would want to hear is the sound of my lon lonely kazoo. Um, I'm not going to give them the seriousness. They're leading people astray. But I'm not mocking them because I don't care about the people they're hitting, you know, the people they're harming, the people they're hurting. Um, so I believe that this is a, this is a, as funny as it may sound, this is a giftedness issue. Um, I think some people are called to be Jeremiah's and they're, they're, they're just called to be weeping prophets. I think other, others are called to sometimes be partly that and partly something else. Elijah is different than Amos, is different than Isaiah, is different than Jeremiah. And I have nothing but um, 
respect for people who can weep over Jerusalem. But the man who wept over Jerusalem was the same one who made fun of their flowing robes, their phylacteries, their haircuts, or whatever else. You know, he, he, had, he said some things at their expense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, two things. In the early days, as I read Credenda Agenda, not knowing Doug at all, all I read was satire. And um, I, I didn't know if he was a cynic at heart. And I didn't like the tone of it. It didn't feel pastoral. And I didn't know him as a pastor. And never anything else. And uh, I think 99% satire is unwise. And I don't think that is your life uh, as a pastor and as a husband. Um, so that's the first thing. My take after years of awareness is that you're not at root a cynic. You're not at root ugly, mean-spirited, bitter, but robustly, jovially, passionately uh, in hatred of sin and love of God and all the delights that hate at sin destroys. And, um, and so I, I don't stumble as much as I used to. And I don't know if you got the proportion right yet, but I don't. I don't. Working on it, working on it. But here's, here's probably the reason I say what I say. And it's just, it's again, rooted in my weaknesses. Um, I don't buy gum because, like I said last Sunday, I chew the whole pack in a, in a minute. My first reaction to the gay pride is disgust and to go where you wind up with eloquence. I know that my first reaction is not as loving as I'd like it to be. I feel like in my first reaction, there is truth and wisdom there. I'm not, I think disgust is appropriate, but knowing myself, I'm also sinning because the movement from disgust to go to hell is, is slippery and near and go to hell is a sin to say that I think that is not to want them to be saved. And I do want them to be saved. So I rescue myself from myself by making myself write those things. That is, I go to my knees and I say, God, I'm not feeling that way. <laughs> Would you help me to feel more compassion towards people whose first reaction are making me so angry and what they're destroying in this world? I don't even want my children to know the word queer or gay or homosexual when they're eight years old. They shouldn't even have to deal with that and on and on and on. And so I try to pull back and say, God, teach me other things about capacities in me. I want to I want to treat my wife more compassionately, my daughter more compassionately, my church. So a lot of my bent is running away from a sinful side of me and protecting myself from it. I really do believe Doug is a healthier person than I am in significant ways. And I could point to other people. Like I think Mark Dever. Hi, Mark. You ever listen to this? Mark just strikes me as being so uh, free from the kinds of inner introspective turmoils that are from who knows where inside of me that he can just say things much more quickly and easily. And, and, uh, just, and I'm always second-guessing my motives. And, and therefore, I'm... I'm leaning towards the trying to become a more compassionate person than a more cleverly indicting person because I think I'm, that would come pretty naturally to me whereas I, I don't think uh, Doug is wired in such a way that to write what he wrote there is nearly so much a temptation to be sinful as it, as it would be for me that's helpful. Well, I want to thank you both for participating in this. This has been really helpful, I hope, for all of you, and thank you for sticking around. Um, and John, I just wonder uh, if you'd pray to close us out. And before I pray, let me just, you know, this group is left. Thank you for being here. When we're done with this prayer, we're done with the conference, really done. And so uh, this is my last opportunity to say thank you. We're really, really happy you were here. May, may God grant us to apply what we've heard. Father in heaven, I sure say that for myself, all I've heard from these speakers 
rich, rich, rich. Thank you for Ramez, and thank you for Crawford, and thank you for Darren, and thank you for Doug, and thank you for all who've led this conference. And now, Lord, make us better fathers, better husbands, better pastors, better leaders for the women that are here, better single women, better wives, and better church minister, uh, members and ministers. So, God, be pleased, I pray, to multiply the effectiveness of what's been done here. Give it a ripple effect across the churches, the neighborhoods, and the nations, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.